Welcome to Archetypes. I'm Lee Woodruff, and I'm here with Darren Strauss, who is an author, a book award winner, father, professor. Need I go on? Please don't. Do I have, I have got it covered? <laughs> I think that's it, yeah. Which book is your favorite book? It's so hard to say. I think the one that you've, that you've finished most recently is the one you like the best because you're protective of it. So uh, the memoir, which is called Half a Life, um, it's about something that happened to me when I was a kid that was sort of tough. And so that, I think, I feel the most defensive about. What happened? Can you tell us? Sure. When I was, um, I was 18, and I was driving with some friends, and um, a girl swerved through traffic into my car and died. And um, it turned out that she was committing suicide via my car. And uh, so that was obviously really hard. And it turned out that I knew her, even though we were a couple of towns over from where I lived. She um, just happened to have gone to my school, and that was, um, it was rough. Her parents told me that no matter what I did in my life, they would support me. And uh, I had to live my life for two people. I had to be twice as successful, twice as happy, because I owed that to her. And if I did that, they would always uh, have my back. And I didn't really know what that meant, but I... I um, I tried to do it, and then six months later, they sued me for millions of dollars. So it was uh, it was tough in a lot of ways. And then the case eventually went away because they knew um, they knew that I wasn't at fault. But it was seven years with this dread of financial ruin hanging over me. So that was it was really tough. As a teenager. As a teenager and, and early twenty something adult. It was funny. It, it was a secret of mine. I mean, I moved to New York, and um, had good friends who didn't even know about this. I, it was just something I didn't talk about. When I was 36, um, my wife was pregnant, and so I started to understand in a more visceral way how hard it would be to lose a child as I was facing parenthood. And then I also realized that I had lived exactly as long with the accent as I had lived before it. Uh, it had happened half my life ago, so I thought it was time to examine it. And the way I deal with things is I just write about them. I wasn't planning on publishing it, but I started writing it, and it just seemed like, like a book. And I guess I wrote it for my 18-year-old self. I felt like if I had had this book when I was 18, or a book like it, then it would have been a lot easier. Did you, in a way, exercise your own demons in the process of writing this story? I did. It really was therapeutic, and I would recommend anyone who's going through something tough, not just writers, um, write it down. Writing involves a lot of decisions, putting one word after another. And just making those decisions gives you a power over the material and gets you in control of it. So it's not this blob of amorphous thoughts in your head, but something you can, you can shape. And that, that gives you a real control over your, over your story. What is the one thing that most people don't know about you? Wow, a tough one. Um, that I when I was in my early 20s, I had to decide between trying to play the guitar for a living or writing for a living. So clearly you chose writing over guitar. How did you make that choice? I don't really know. And sometimes I think it was a mistake. There's a great line from Philip Roth where he said that the difference between being a professional writer and an Olympic swimmer is that the Olympic swimmer does not feel like she's going to drown every time she jumps in the pool. And so there's something so hard about writing that just doesn't happen with the guitar. I mean, it's hard to get good at the guitar. But imagine if every time you picked up the guitar, you're like, I don't know if I know how to play. You know, I can't do this. How do I make a chord? But every time you start a new story, it's sort of like, how do I do this again? And that, that's something that never really goes away. But I was thinking about something that I heard on the way over here. I was listening to the radio, and Kobe Bryant was talking. And he was saying that he became great because he put all his eggs in one basket, which people say not to do. But he, he said, the only thing I'm going to do is focus on, on basketball, because he felt like, if I meet someone who worked harder than I did, they can beat me. And I thought, you know, I wish I hadn't gotten good at these other things. I wish I hadn't learned how to ski, because I was a ski bum for a year. I wish I hadn't done the guitar. I wish I had just focused on writing. But don't you think there's something great to being a Renaissance man? I mean, you chose to do all these things well, so you're Kobe Bryant and you break your ankle. What happens then? There is something to that, you know. Um, but I playing the guitar is just is easy and fun, when writing is but, you know, there's something about writing, we, we talked about it a little bit, the cathartic process of it. I mean, I think that being a writer, if you do it well, sort of forces you to, to be a thoughtful person um, in all senses of the word, someone who thinks about things. 
but also someone who is empathetic because when you write well you have to sort of give everyone due process you have to sort of give all your characters you have to be uh, the defense attorney of all your characters you can't consign anyone to hell Saul Bellow said you have to the villains can't be all evil and the heroes can't be all good or it's not a good book so there's something I hope beneficial about that where do you get your ideas you just have to sort of hunt around for them and something will um, will click with you. It has to be an idea that you like for a year or two years or three years when you're writing a novel. But there's a, another good quote from Norman Mailer. He said, um, he said, inspiration is for amateur writers. You can't wait for inspiration because you have to do it every day if it's your, if it's your livelihood. So you can't wait to be inspired. You have to try to write all the time, you know? And, um, and some days that's just kicking yourself in the ass. Colson Whitehead said, though, don't go looking for your story. Your story will find you. What do you say to that? You know something? I know Colson. We're in a poker game together. He's, he's bullshit, it really is what I say about that. <laughs> yeah. Colson is a great guy, um, but he works very hard at it. He doesn't wait for his story. Inspiration like, is important, but you have to, you, you, do can't, have to you can't wait for it. It's you a can't, craft. Yeah, you just, you know, because what happens if it doesn't come and you're, and you're making a living as a writer? You, you're going to wait six months, a year? You know, you can't do that. What advice would you give your kids if they want to be writers? And would you like them to be writers? I would say, if you can do anything else, <laughs> do it. <laughs> but if, if they insisted, I would say, you know, um, just put all your eggs in one basket, to quote Kobe Bryant, you know? I think work as hard as you can on that thing. Um, I don't know where um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell got this, but he said if you work on anything for 10,000 hours, you'll be great at it. Um, and I think there's a lot to that. Um, and 10,000 hours, I did the math, is if you write five days a week for four hours a day, it's eight years. So if you're, if you're 16 and you say, I want to be a writer, and you write four hours a day, five days a week, you'll be a great writer at 24. You know, the formula is probably a little random and not exact, but I don't think people are necessarily born um, Tolstoy or Kobe Bryant or John Lennon. Um, but you put the hours in and you get, you get good. You're a professor at NYU uh -huh. and you're teaching creative writing classes? Yes, to grad students and undergrad. Any words of wisdom about teaching? Anything about, you've learned? About teaching, yeah. It, it forces you to think about why you do what you do. Or if, if you write and you don't think about it, you might just sit down and thoughtlessly start scribbling. But when you have to sort of vocalize your aesthetic, when you have to sort of put into words how you do what you do, it sort of forces you to think about it and hopefully become better at, at learning why you do what you do well and, and pinpoint what it is that makes you good at something. Having articulated, I think, really does make you think about, about what works and that can only help you in your craft. Well, and you do your craft well, Darren Strauss. Thanks for saying that and thanks for having me in. It was a real pleasure. Thank you for being here and thank you for watching Archetypes. We'll see you again.